Thank you. And uh, yeah, me and Goran, we had a miscommunication. I thought he was going to do the intro, but here I am. And I have the shirt to prove it. So. Uh, welcome. Very nice to see you here on a s Saturday. Uh, cool that people are taking time off to learn stuff. That's really nice. Today it's Global AI Developer Days. Uh, so you figured why Global AI? Well, it's a, it's a bigger community run by mostly Microsoft uh, people. And we are just hosting one part of this Global AI Developer Day initiative. But if you go online, you can see it's running around the globe. It's been running since Thursday. There's a lot of content online, so just go find it. The content you consume here will also be online, so that's nice. Quick look at the agenda. We'll um, learn and eat. So, Asha Skone. Yeah, we're over 1,100 members now. That's pretty cool. Um, it's all about learning, networking, having fun. So everyone is welcome. You don't have to like Asher. You don't have to know anything about computing. You can just come here, hang out, eat pizza. That's totally fine. Everyone is welcome. Uh, the Asher Skone crew, it's uh, me. My name is Michael. I'm a former MVP. I joined Microsoft. I lost my MVP title. Uh, but I like cloud, basically, Azure technology in general. Then we have Goran. He's an uh, Azure AI MVP. He also likes cloud and, and really new stuff. If you go online and look up his blogs, there's a ton, bunch of cool stuff. And the session you see today is probably mind-blowing also. Magnus, he's uh, also an MVP and a Microsoft Regional Director. Uh, Usually traveling around, speaking at different places. But he's a member of our crew. And we're always open for anyone else to join and arrange these. Uh, if you know anyone, preferably a female, you know, just to get the diversity in, it would be really appreciated. And if you are on these events and you like it, you tweet about it, you post on LinkedIn, yeah, even Facebook. <laughs> Uh, please use the hashtag #AsherScone. It's an English pronunciation of Scone. Uh, we also have a Twitter account and a LinkedIn page, so feel free to join and follow us. We wanna thank our sponsors, our hosts, Cool Cafe, always. Thank you so much. And we have some upcoming meetups. You can see in November the 23rd, Synapse Extraction. It's a really cool thing. Uh, so feel free to uh, attend. And then Nico, where are you? There. We'll talk about Service Bus in December. So that's also pretty nice. And if, if you don't, if, if it's not your topic, but if you know someone, please uh, give them a hint that this is happening. And if you are interested in speaking, it's a safe place. Everyone is welcome. You don't have to be professional. You, I mean, you're welcome if you are, but that's not a requirement at all. If you are trying to get into speaking or, s or community work or stuff, you know, this is a safe place. Please feel free to, to submit something. And now to one of the bigger points here. <laughs> feels like I'm always talking about this one. But uh, during COVID, we felt really disconnected from the community, so we started a Discord channel. So I've been hanging out here for two years by myself, basically. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, uh, there's some good discussions. There's uh, some people joining, so feel free to join this community. One thing that I've observed is that people usually miss, uh, see if this works. So when you join, <coughs> oh, this is, this is hard. So when you join, there's this welcome button here. And please click this one. Read these conducts. Basically just 
you know, acknowledging that you would be a nice person, not talking trash and being an A person. So, um, yeah, once you click that button, all of this will open up. I use this daily by myself. Uh, Azure updates, for example, daily updates about what's being deprecated and so on. There's a lot of uh, talks about security. It's a hot topic. Pretty good um, guidance on uh, on uh, accelerators, if uh, like getting started with the uh, cloud stuff. So, yeah, please join. Uh, since you're a member of Azure Skåne, there's a big conference coming in uh, Copenhagen. If you use that code there, you get a 10% discount if you think about attending. You can see there's some pretty prominent names, keynoting, for example. But that's all. Welcome. Nice to see you all. And let's hand over to Elena. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, so hello, so thank you for inviting me as a speaker here. Uh, I will give you an introduction, uh, I'll give you, I will give you a session about introduction to AI explainability. My name is uh, Milena Bajic, I work as a data scientist in Pandora. Uh, before this, uh, uh, I did a PhD in particle physics and then I did a postdoc uh, in machine learning. Uh, so. Uh, so first, uh, let's, I will give you a short summary of my talk. So I will uh, I'll go through what is explainable uh, AI, I'll give some introduction, and I will try to motivate why is this important. Then uh, I'm going to continue with some explainability methods. I'm going to give uh, an overview of uh, what we can use to actually understand the AI, the AI models better. And then I'm going to go to the second part of my talk, uh, which is uh, going to be the more, pra more, practical, more practical part. And here I'm going to show how to actually do uh, data science on Azure Databricks. And then after this, I'm going to give you an example of uh, an income prediction above a certain level and interpretation of important features. And this is going to be done uh, on Azure Databricks. So let's first uh, just uh, give a short uh, summary of the status of artificial intelligence today. So today, artificial intelligence is very successfully applied uh, in many systems, for example, in recommendation systems, in image detection, uh, in facial recognition, and many others. And we are applying it successfully in many industries. But then, uh, when we look at those models, if we go to very complex problems, we actually use quite complex uh, models. And they are usually, in cases, in complex uh, problems, they're usually based on uh, neural networks. In the right uh, part of the slide, uh, you can see a sketch of a neural network. So uh, this is a uh, relatively complex model where we have inputs, which are here showed by x. Those are some variables which are measured. And then at the end, we can see y, which is our prediction and or our target. Uh, in between, we have several layers, which are called hidden layers, and each of them is having some units. And each of those units is doing some transformation. So overall, a neural network is uh, making a pretty complex, actually, transformation of the input data. And sometimes it's very hard to understand how it actually transformed each feature and how did each of those features impacted the output. So that's why we sometimes call those models as black bo box models. So now we can say uh, if this model is performing well, so we have a really good performance, why should we care about what actually happens? So, but actually we're gonna see that this is quite important 
uh, for many reasons, and that's why we actually uh, come to the field of explainable artificial intelligence, which is a new field in machine learning where we are actually developing methods uh, to explain those black box models. So then, so why is explainable AI important? Uh, for example, uh, there was one model which were analyzing images, so it was based on CNNs, and it was looking at images of wolves versus dogs. So the, uh, the researchers developed a model which was able to classify those, those uh, images with very good uh, accuracy. But then when they put it into production, it was performing way worse. And then the question was, what happened? Then uh, the researchers had to debug the model, and they figured out that most of the pictures of the wolf had snow in it. And what actually the AI model learned was actually just to detect the snow. So the AI model was analyzing all those pictures, detecting the snow, and if the snow was in the picture, it was predicting a wolf. So this is, uh, we say, a bit problematic. So, uh, so that's why we actually really have to understand what are the features that we are using, because snow is not the feature that we want to use in this problem. So we want to actually understand how did the AI make this decision, what was the variable it used actually in the model. This then helps us to debug the models and to improve them, and this also meets uh, putting some bad models into production. It also increases trust. Transparency in effects, uh, fairness and ethics, so we're not using uh, some uh, wrong variables in prediction, and it also uh, comp uh, helps us comply to the law. So now let's uh, give an overview of machine learning models. So currently we have many machine learning models. We can start uh, from the bottom part. In the bottom part we can see, for example, linear regression and decision trees. Those are relatively simple models. Uh, and then, like, we can use them successfully on some simple problems. But if we go to something more complex, we have to use some more complex problems. The most comp the complex one would be neural networks. Then we have also some which are combination of different neural networks, which makes it even more complex. So the advantage of neural networks is actually it's giving a much better performance. But on the other hand, it's very hard to understand what is going on, it's very hard to debug it, and it's very hard to see whether we are using the right features. So that's why we can see that the models are classified in kind of like two different ways. So here we have uh, the simple models, but uh, th so those models we can actually understand very well, and then we have those complex with a better uh, performance, but we don't really understand them very well. So then let's now focus on this part of the graph. Uh, so here we look at those interpretable models. So why are they interpretable? For example, uh, what is a linear model? This is the most simple uh, model that you can use in machine learning. So you, you represent your target as just a linear uh, combination of your inputs. So here x1 and x2 are some input variables. Uh, y is the target. And a, b1 and b2 are some coefficients that we learned during the training process. And then just for some basic math, we know that uh, those coefficients are actually showing how important is this variable. So if, for example, if we get a B1 that is quite high, we know that this X1 variable is very important. Also from the sign, we can see how it impacts the prediction. So basically, if we, for example, if we increase X1 by 1, we're going to have an increase in the output Y by uh, B1. So this is very understandable. We can see like how it impacts and what is important. Then we can go to another uh, simple model, which is called the decision tree. So for example, if you have a problem with loan approval, uh, decision tree just builds some rules. And those rules are uh, optimized during the training process. So this actually tree is going to be optimized to actually um, minimize some value called the gene impurity. So for example, if the person is having like credit history that is good, and then we can see if it has um, if it has like a high loan amount, the decision the, the, this will be, for example, the application will be approved. So we can very easily understand what here happened. We can see whether it makes any sense, and, we, and uh, uh, we can actually also comply to the law here. So, but then now, um, let's look at also those complex models. So the complex models, as I said, uh, they have a better performance, but they're not easily understandable. So. Uh, basically, this seems that we have two options in machine learning. We can use a complex model, it's going to give a good performance, but it's not going to be easily understandable. Or we can use a simple model, which is going to be easily understandable, but it's going to have a worse performance. So we basically see that we can choose 
uh, whether to use an interpretable or accurate model. Or perhaps, can we actually use a complex model, but then derive some explanation procedure? And this is something that we're going to focus on. And uh, this is called the post hoc explainability. It's called post hoc because it's applied on an already trained model, so after the whole model development process has been done. So for example, if you go to the post hoc uh, methods, so let's say those are the methods here we can see in the red. So those are methods we're going to apply to neural networks, support vector machines, and XG boost. Uh, we have many of many different types. Some are, for example, model agnostic. It means that they can be applied on any type of a model. Then we have model specific, which can be just applied on some model. There are many of them, as you can see, but we're going to focus on the two most commonly used ones. They are SHAP and LIME, which I'm going to explain a bit in more detail on the next slides. And then here we can see just an overview of inherently explainable models. So we have one more actually categorization. This is with respect to the scope. So just uh, we call uh, the method the local if we're explaining one single observation. So for example, if the person came, asked for a, a credit and was rejected, why was this person uh, rejected? We give an explanation. We have a global where we uh, average this over many samples and we explain the whole model. So now, uh, now I'm going to focus on SHAP. SHAP is the most commonly uh, used uh, uh, tool today. So this is uh, based in game theory, it has a very good mathematical background, and it's actually the best way to use, uh, to do use this. So uh, what it means? Basically, uh, so uh, it was developed by one, uh, uh, by one Nobel Prize winner who actually uh, was examining the problem where we have many players, and uh, all players contribute uh, to the game in different ways, and then uh, they get an award. And how can we actually distribute this award in a fair way? So how could what would be a mathematical way to do this? So we could um, look at one player, and then we can look at all other people who are in the game, and then we could build all possible subsets of those people. Then we can take one subset, and we can compute what would the award be with this subset plus the player, and minus only the award with this subset. And then if we compute this, this is called the marginal contribution of this player. Then we can actually average those over all subsets, and uh, we're going to get uh, the contribution of this player. So this is called the Sharp value, and it's, very, uh, and it's currently applied in machine learning. Just instead of uh, one player, we're going uh, to have a feature. So if we want to say which, uh, how uh, much each feature contributes to our prediction, we can actually compute the Sharp value for this feature. So, uh, if we if we look uh, here in this sketch, uh, so we have um, basically like a something uh, like a Sharp library, and then uh, as an input, it takes uh, the train model, and it can take a single instance or a few instances or whole data, and it actually uh, provides the explanation in terms of those Sharply values. So of course, we can mm, already see that this is going to be computationally very expensive because uh, we, have to, uh, we have to actually compute the model for many subsets. So in real life, we don't always want to, use to do this, so we also want to actually use some, uh, some approximations. So for example, the Shapley library comes with several uh, types of explainers. So for example, this is the general one. It can be applied on all models. It's going to compute the Shapley value average over all subsets, but it's going to be slow. Then we can go to this kernel explainer. Uh, this is going to be an approx approximation of Shapley value. So instead of computing over all the subsets, it's going to compute on just a sample of subsets. And it's going to be, of course, faster. And then we have uh, some uh, which focus on special models. So this one is going to focus on tree explainer. And this one is going to, the deep explainer is going to focus on uh, neural networks. Uh, so we have uh, one more also commonly used uh, library. It's called Lime, and this is actually uh, it also ex it can explain just some uh, instances, but it has a bit of a different approach where we just let's say look at a small part of the data, and then in this small area they fit a very simple model, a simple model which is inherently explainable. So for example, like a linear model, they fit a linear model there, and then they compute the coefficients, and they use those coefficients to actually understand what is important per this area. This is a simpler model, and it's only in a specific area of interest, and it's faster than SHAP. 
So as a summary, we had intrinsically interpretable models, uh, simpler, simpler uh, they interpreted by their definition. An example was linear, uh, linear regression, decision trees. And then we had this post hoc method supplied on black box model, uh, like neural networks, energy boost, uh, support vector machines, and so on. Uh, so now we're going to go to the second part of the talk. In this second part, I'm going to actually focus on showing you uh, one example. How is this done? So first, uh, um, let's look at actually the how we actually do data science on uh, Azure with Databricks. So we actually use uh, Databricks. This is an analytics platform. It actually provides access uh, to clusters. Uh, those clusters can be run in a distributed way, can be optimized. We can install all the libraries we need there. And then uh, it also provides, um, so, so basically it, it we can, um, and then it can be also, uh, it can work uh, very well together with Azure. So what we do actually here, we get the data. So this data can be from some files, it can be from the web, uh, it can be from an IoT device. From this, uh, we take the data in. Then we have something called the Delta Lake in Databricks. Here's the data is stored. Then after this, we go to the model development stage, and this is where actually data scientists uh, uh, work. So here uh, we actually, um, uh, we can use all common libraries. So we can install like SKLearn, Keras, PyTorch, um, like all of them can be used in Databricks. And then we use this to develop the model, to tune the model. Then we have something very useful, which is called MLflow. So this library actually tracks are all models. It tracks uh, every version, attaches the code with it, and it actually saves uh, uh, the outputs. Uh, and it also, we can register the model, and then we can also deploy it using this. So now let's actually go to one example. In the example, uh, I'm going to use this uh, census data set. So this is a data set that you can download from this uh, link. And it uh, has uh, some data about individuals. And uh, the goal is to predict the probability that an individual will make over, let's say, 50K uh, a year. So the setup we're going to use is going to be Azure Databricks, Jupyter Notebook, and the SHAP library. So let's say I'm going to just now uh, show you the code, and I'm going to try to explain a bit. Uh, OK. So this is going to be a simple example. Uh, sorry? Uh, is it fine now? OK. Uh, is, it this, is it like this? OK. So, so basically, like now we are working on a Jupyter notebook on Databricks. So when we do this, we first have to connect to the cluster. We have to install the libraries on the cluster. And then if we are missing some of the libraries, we can also install them here uh, in the notebook. So let's see, we are installing here Shad. Uh, just normally using pip. Uh, then we just import all the libraries that we need, and then we look at the data. So the data has, uh, for example, we have uh, age, we have uh, work class, education, marital status, and so on. So this, those are the input features that we're going to use. Uh, we import, actually, the data. We can here pr uh, define some, actually, uh, some uh, functions uh, to prepare this data to extract some important variables. Uh, here, actually, we load it. And then uh, we have to do some pre-processing, so preparation for machine learning. So for example, for all categorical variables, we do here we do one hot encoding. Uh, so after uh, this, uh, we actually look at, uh, at the our, our target. The target is a salary, but uh, we're not going to build a regression model. So the regression model would be if we were predicting just the value, but instead of it, we're going to focus on a classification model. So it's going to just, we're going to map this salary to values of 0 or 1. So 1 is if it's above 50k, and 0 if it's uh, less than that. We have to scale them, because for neural networks, uh, we always have to scale the inputs. So then uh, after we do this, let's look at the data. So we can see we have the age, we have capital gain, capital loss, hours break. So this is uh, each of the person. Of course, those are not the absolute values. Those are the scaled values. So for example, uh, minus uh, one would be me that uh, this person has like minus one standard deviation uh, from the average in the data set respect. There. So it's a younger person actually. While those with plus will be older persons. Uh, so this is our target. It's uh, it's like whether the salary is above uh, 50k, 
And then now let's build a model. So for the model, we can use, of course, many types of models, but here we're going to use one simple neural network. So the neural network is actually here based on Keras. Uh, this is one of the libraries that you can use. Uh, for example, what it does, uh, it takes the input here, the shape means uh, the number of uh, the number of features, then it builds uh, two inner layers, uh, which are dense, and this is the number of units they have. And here is the here is basically where the main computation is done. And then at the end, we end up with the layer, which is giving the probability that, uh, based on this data, we're going to have um, income above uh, 50k. So then we compile the model, uh, we train it using our train and validation uh, sets. After this, uh, we can check the performance on the test uh, data set. Here we get the performance. We can see that uh, overall performance is like 85% of accuracy. So that means that in 85% of cases, we're going to get the correct, uh, correct prediction. So this means this, uh, this model is pretty good. Uh, but now let's actually understand uh, um, is this model actually using the correct features and what was actually important in this uh, black box model. So then. Um, to understand this, we're going to focus now on SHAP, and I'm going to show the local and the global uh, explainability. So to use the SHAP library, uh, you have to define this um, object called the uh, SHAP explainer. So this was the, uh, so here I'm going to use the exact computation, not the approximation. So then here we can compute the SHAP values. Um, SHAP values are computed per each of the of the features, and then let's actually now use those SHAP values, and let's look uh, what uh, what they tell us. So I'm going to look at one of the examples. So let's say this was a person which is a bit uh, older, has a higher capital gain. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, and we can see other variables here. Um, so then if we want to, uh, to actually uh, get some insights from the SHAP, we can like create, for example, this waterfall plot. Uh, and then let's actually look what it uh, gives us. So the uh, the prediction for this person was that uh, it's a 50 is 0 0.59. Actually, this is the probability that the person will have uh, the income above a certain level. But then let's see how 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 we came up to this how we came up to this uh, actually value. So those are the features that have the highest sharp values. So it means the features that are most important. So they are ranked uh, by their importance. You can see that the capital gain. Uh, increased this probability by 31%. Uh, so this means that if, if we didn't have the capital gain, this probability would be by 35%, uh, uh, would be 35% smaller, and we would get actually uh, different uh, different predictions. So it would be zero actually here. Then we have the second one is uh, the relationship, then the education, we have the age, and then the ones which are blue, they are actually decreasing it. So. Uh, for example, this uh, occupation that the person has is actually decreasing this probability by 0 0.02. So we can also sum up this with this nice uh, force plot. So all the variables that are uh, increasing the prediction are shown in red, and the variables which are decreasing it are shown uh, in blue. And basically now uh, we can say that this is making sense because the variables uh, we see uh, are something that, that would make sense for a person. And we can also, if the person comes and asks, uh, why is my prediction like this, uh, we can explain it to the person. Uh, then we also have global explanations uh, for this. For example, this is one of the visualizations that we can use. So we get, um, we get that the most important is like relationship, then capital gain, age, and so on. Uh, here we can see that this differs a bit because this is uh, average overall samples. And when we have just one sample, it can happen, for example, the person has one feature and s uh, that is very uh, off, so it's going to be, uh, it's going to impact it quite a lot. Uh, so basically, this is the global explanation that we have, and uh, using the SHAP in this way, uh, we have explained what are the important features and what actually impacted the model. Um, so then to sum up, uh, uh, then to sum up, uh, basically, um, like you, you can use like SHAP, you install it like this, you train test and tune your any model. It doesn't have to be a neural network, it can be any other model, it can be even like inherently explainable model because this is a general approach that you can use. Uh, then you can uh, explain the data in two ways, so using like one simple point, one point or several points, or you can do it the, the globally. Those were the uh, 
uh, the results that we got. So as a summary, uh, I give uh, I gave uh, instruction to explainable AI. Uh, I, tr I actually tried to motivate why is this important. Uh, then we uh, went through some explainability methods, uh, the intrinsic one, and then also the post hoc ones with the focus on the sharp values. And then I introduced actually our setup, uh, how we do data science on Azure Databricks. And then we saw one uh, example on Azure Bricks, uh, so how we can uh, use it uh, for this, let's say, income prediction above a certain level and give interpretation of uh, important features, um, both uh, local and uh, uh, global aspect. So that was it. Uh, thank you. So do you have some questions? Yeah. Yes. So, so basically we have to apply our own logic. So does this make sense? So if we think that this does not make sense, we actually have to debug the model. And then we have to actually see why was this decision made. Because it was made because of something. So it could be that the shoe size were actually, for example, highly correlated with something that is actually important. And then instead of picking up this other variable, it picked up the shoe size, basically. But then we would have to actually debug um, to find some correlations with the variable. It doesn't make sense, but it's uh, listed as important. And then actually uh, we would perhaps have to decorrelate the variables so or perhaps use some technique like PCA to actually uh, remove this, those correlations. But basically we, we can identify that we have a problem and then we can debug it and see how to improve. In principle, yes, you can do it. So you could give, you could assign some weights. Like you could perhaps, like during the training process, you could assign, for example, that the weight is in, s that in you could give some initial weights and you could set them in some range. For example, you could set like, you could limit them actually. So to be like between this value and another value, and you could say like, if this is very important, I can try to push this variable to be more important. So I kind of like hard code some range of the weight or else you can also try to give some penalization. So you could kind of like uh, add an additional term into the loss function because during training we actually minimize this loss function and it could give an additional kind of cost. So let's say if this variable gets a high weight, which means if this variable is getting important, just kind of reduce it. So like just give some small, small correct, like some correction to it. Uh, in principle, if you get something like that, for example, it's usually, there's usually some other cause. Some other cause, for example, if you get, let's say that the female have certain behavior, it's usually, there's usually something behind it. So for example, like something social that actually uh, caused this. And then maybe we don't have this data or maybe the model just didn't have enough samples and then it learned this other thing instead of the initial thing. So that's why this is also important because sometimes uh, if we are in general in machine learning we just optimize the performance. So we want to minimize the loss function. But then sometimes this ends up that it learned either wrong ways or something like that's really not fair and it's actually not correct. So like if we observe this we can actually fix it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Some uh, 15 years ago, I was working for a, for a bank on data exchange between the bank and the central registry for the loans. 
So basically, in each country, there is a central registry. Uh, in that way, you are not able to go in the same day in five banks and get loans everywhere. If you have a loan, right, you cannot get it in the other bank unless you have good enough score. And uh, back then, there was no AI models and uh, stuff. They probably use some nowadays. But uh, interesting uh, about it was uh, that data was really huge list, like huge questionnaire. And some questions over there were like, uh, okay, does this person have a pet? You know, and that was kind of confusing. Like, why is this even, you know, a parameter in the whole, whole thing? And the thing was like, if you have a pet, if you are able to purchase a food for that pet, you probably have some extra money, right? That you are able to spend and uh, things like that. So uh, yeah, this list of parameters, I think over here is super short <laughs> compared to what I've seen and it was 15 years ago. So, and over back then it was not like, uh, yeah, no, no AI. Basically here, like we can have, a, we have actually way more variables, but the just the model it identified those ones as the, as the important ones. So just the other ones it uh, identified as the unimportant ones for the decision. You could, yes. So for example, if after the training you apply this technique, then at the end you can see like, for example, those other features were not important. And yes, you can actually throw them away and this way you can also save some data storage. But then you would have to, of course, like uh, do some corrections to the model because if the model is taking in more features, then you have to give some dummy values instead of them just to make it technically work. But yeah, it can be used like that also. And in a real world setting, computing this graph, is that even possible without the optimizations? I mean, if you have a big model and you have a lot of training data? Yeah, yeah, you can, this is, uh, ge this is done in general. So uh, this I'm just is wondering if yeah. it takes forever. Um, so it depends. So if you if you would use like uh, this uh, general explainer, and if you would apply it on a neural network, then yes, probably yes. I mean, you shouldn't in general use that uh, if you have like a complex model and lots of data. So you have basically this deep e deep explainer that you should use in that case, and it's actually optimized to make it efficient for neural networks. Or I mean, it would take a lot, but uh, then you just have to use one of the approximation techniques. And then if you retrain your model, you have to run it again because then this doesn't... Um, so if you retrain your model, I mean, if the model was good, you would expect that this uh, global doesn't change. So or if it changes significantly, then perhaps there was some actually problem. Because, because maybe uh, if you retrain because you got new data, maybe there was some difference in the new data or in the... Maybe there was some inherent uh, difference or there was some difference in data collection. So in principle, you, you shouldn't, this shouldn't change actually a lot. Uh, the last question is, uh, can the model uh, be different for its candidate, like for a younger person um, their work situation plays a more important role for a uh, kind of older person, uh, other, I don't know, other factors are more important? Yes, it can be actually that, uh, so for, we can also look at like, for example, for young persons, it can be that it has uh, variables that are different, like it will have different important variables than for example, uh, for an older person. And this can be also used for example, for different, let's say, uh, groups of people. We can also examine actually what is most important, for example, for success in one group and what is more, more important in another group. So this is just an average over all the data set. But if we go to some um, smaller areas of samples, so some clusters, some gruppations, they're going to have a different, uh, uh, different like importance of variables. So it's, it's really actually useful for understanding the model. Um, I'm just wondering, in, in terms of uh, probability, is there a breakdown between how much effort you put to go from 95 to 96, or wh where is it that you kind of say, let, let's, let's see, uh, let's stop here? I'm just curious about. 
where you stop in the um, So in principle, um, sometimes you just cannot go much up. So like, uh, if we cannot just go to 99% because we want to go to 99%. Because it depends on what we have in the data. Because if we, if we actually, machine learning, it doesn't work everywhere. It works only if we have actually some function between the inputs and the outputs. And then it depends like how many variables if you have. So if you have like the really all important ones, you could actually say I'm gonna go to some really high importance. But if you don't have it, and sometimes you're gonna have a, uh, just if you get a uh, prediction which is better than random prediction, then a random guess, this means that the model is working. So sometimes it's just not possible to go to, to 0.9%. So now this is a nice example where we all understand uh, the variables or the features. Mm -hmm. um, but what if this was applied to like some image recognition problem or something like that? Yes. So you can also uh, use this in image in recognition. This can be used with image recognition and with text. But then in image recognition, you have also variables. But then those variables will be different. They're going. They can be like some parts of the image. Let's say like uh, some figures some like shapes the the model is finding and then you can actually even like assign like the feature importance to the part of the image that's important so for example if you have an image uh, this method could actually actually mark you with the colors what is the part of the image that was used for prediction so you could actually uh, figure out what part of the image is used for classification and you can also use it for the text Sorry, I'm an old guy, but in, in traditional statistics, I would go for many components and try to avoid to have too many features. Yeah. So I, is the number of features what makes it so difficult to explain what you're actually presenting to your customer? So uh, partially, yes. So in machine learning, also, we shouldn't have too many features. If we get too many features, it's really hard to train because we have like a <laughs> really huge space that we're trying to optimize. So basically, you should always do some uh, feature selection in the beginning uh, or remove some constant features. Uh, but then this approach is just more if you have kind of features ready and then you want to say uh, which ones were the ones that are used actually for predictions and which were the most impactful ones. So you can see whether your model learned the right things. So it's kind of to debug the model. I, is there a risk of sort of overdoing the model when you have too many features. Yes, of course. Yes, so it's also like more complex and uh, it's also sometimes uh, your risk of actually getting way worse performance because sometimes models just cannot train. If you don't have, if you have limited amount of data and you have really a lot of feature, you have like a huge space and you're trying actually to minimize one function and it's uh, it can be basically impossible. Like the um, just the model can can end up in some local minima, just never go to the global minima. So actually, you help the training process by removing the, var the features which are not important. For example, if you have a constant feature, that's for sure not important because it's not giving you any information. And then if you have features which are not correlated between the input and the output, that's also not useful. And then if you have between inputs, if you have highly correlated features, that means that they they are giving you the same information. So it's just like you're confusing the model, actually, by doing that. May I ask a final question? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> it's all always sort of old statistics again, but yeah. do you use the local part as a way of estimating false positives and false negatives? So uh, you have a global maximum minimum, yeah. and then you sample and try to find out how good or bad stuff are. Yeah, so we compute we compute performance actually. So you can like if you have a classification problem and you have like several classes, so you can uh, you have to want to minimize something, but you can define what you want to minimize. So you can def minimize accuracy if you want to look at all the classes in the same way, or you can like depending on the problem, you can just decide to minimize the true positives uh, or some other actually metrics. So this depends on actually what is important for you in this model and what is which type of error is uh, more dangerous. So actually similar to, st to uh, traditional statistics. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so let's give a big clap to Milena. Thank you.
we'll take a short break and then uh, after the break we will continue with the session in NVIDIA. <laughs>